This podcast is brought to you by Podspot Events. Hello and welcome to the Bondi Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Beattie. The guest on this episode is Tony Gosden, but we all know him as Bondi Tony. Bondi Tony's Burger Joint is my favourite restaurant in Bondi and I usually go there once a week with my friends. So it really was special to be able to record this episode in the restaurant with Tony. In this episode, we talk about the decade Tony spent in the music industry, putting on events and promoting bands such as Tame Impala and Gang of Youths. We talk about how Tony ended up opening his restaurant in Bondi and how he's going with the new restaurant in Enmore. Tony also opens up about some of his more recent mental health struggles and how he's doing today. Tony is one of the biggest characters in the Bondi community, so I really hope you enjoy this episode and listening to Tony's story. And as always, remember to give us a follow on Instagram at the Bondi Podcast. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll find all of our episodes on Spotify. Cheers. Tony, welcome to the Bondi Podcast, mate. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Good to be here. Finally, we got it together. <laughs> Finally, mate. You, know, you, you made me get up on a Saturday morning to do a recording, mate. But, yeah. I didn't want to get up this morning. <laughs> no way. Tony, first question we ask all our guests is, what is our favourite thing about Bondi? So what's your favourite thing about Bondi, mate? Um, I'd have to say community. Yeah, yeah. The community around here is uh, is on another level. A lot of people don't see it. There's like there's the there's a tourist side of it, and then there's a community side of it. You know, and this venue is sort of built around community. So I've seen that like firsthand how much people support you as a local business. You know, so it's it's definitely the community that's around here. That's what keeps me here. Yeah, definitely, no, yeah. I completely agree, mate. Even yeah. just me doing this podcast, like everyone's getting around it. Everyone's like so supportive and yeah, yeah that's I think awesome. it comes down to that yeah. community spirit you get yeah. here in Bondi. Mm. How long have you been here for, mate? I moved here in 96. Wow. Yeah, where, yeah. where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Canberra. Yeah, I'm a Canberra boy, but I travelled heaps. Um, when we were young, my dad was like uh, like a, like in like construction engineering and stuff. So we moved quite a fair bit, you know, Canberra, Perth, Brisbane, Papua New Guinea, wow. Indonesia. So we moved around a fair bit. I didn't spend a lot of time in Indonesia, but mum and dad lived up there for a while, which is pretty cool. And then um, the exchange program in America as well. But, yeah, we moved around a fair bit when I was young. I think it was good because you're forced to uh, go out of your comfort zone and meet people, you know. So I think that's what pretty much made me sort of a people's person. When I say that, I mean I can adapt to any situation quite quickly just because I've been forced to do it my whole life growing up as kids, changing schools, changing suburbs, changing states, changing countries, you know. So you're constantly adapting to new climates, you know, new places and stuff. So... It, at the time, it sucks because you, you, you don't really get a core group of friends because you're always leaving. But I found out later in life it actually has really helped me, especially in this industry. Yeah. So yeah. moved to moved to Bondi in '96. '96, yeah. I was living in London and I overstayed my visa and they deported me <laughs> on my birthday. <laughs> what were you doing in London? I was just hanging around, just getting wasted. <laughs> I was backpacking. Yeah. I so know. I went over there. I went to America. At first, I actually went to America to be an actor, funnily enough, and I was going to join the theatre company and then things went pear-shaped and I was like, I told everyone before I left, I said, I'm not coming back till I'm famous. And uh, I wasn't famous, so I couldn't come home yet. How, <laughs> so, did, how did the acting go? Um, I was meant to join this off-Broadway theatre company in Connecticut. I met a woman here in Australia because I went to um, VCA in Melbourne, Victoria College of the Arts, and um, I met her and she just she knew someone over there. She was doing land art down in uh, Melbourne when I was living in Melbourne. And she goes, I've got this woman, she's got this amazing theatre company in Connecticut. And I was always talking to her about it, you know, and she was always like, you know, um, every time I talked to you, she's like, you know, you're already gone. You're already out of here, you know, and I was just saving all my money. So I saved every penny and then I bought a old 64 Ford Falcon and uh, just drove around America with my 64 mate, mate on guitar and I just was going to drive across America. So I got kind of halfway and then, yeah, I, I, you know, I couldn't sell the car. I wanted to get a flight. It just things went a bit pear-shaped. But it's good because while I drove around America, I ended up writing, you know, loads of music and stuff, you know. And it was just, just – I'd slept in my car. Yeah, so the back seat was my boot, was my, my bed and the boot was my wardrobe. And I slept in this car for like three months. Yeah, yeah, just driving around America. It was pretty awesome. Did yeah. you get any acting gigs? No, no, because I went over there to join the theatre company. So I got to uh, Denver, Colorado, and I was running out of money and I had to sell my car. And in Denver, Colorado, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, rules with smog, smog and stuff. And my car wasn't exempt from smog. Uh, and I couldn't get the right paperwork. I lost my rego papers. So I couldn't actually get it registered and get it done. So I had to drive back to California where it was exempt from smog testing. So I could just go back and just register it, you know. So anyway, it was, it was a bit shit. But that drive back was, was amazing. Like it was, there's this highway called Highway 50, the loneliest highway in America. 
And I just drove along that just by myself in a pair of shorts in my black 64 Ford Falcon and just stopping and playing guitar and writing music. And so that's when I really got into music. Like when I was, you know, I was writing loads of songs at the time, poetry songs, all that sort of stuff. I was, I was fully into it. Yeah, big time. How old were you at this stage time? 20, 20, 24 when I left. Oh. Yeah. I literally left and said, that's it. Like I left, I didn't have anything left here. So I had a couple of boxes left at mum and dad's, but that was it. Yeah. So. And then straight like 24 from America straight back to Bondi? Yeah, no, so I was in the States and then I didn't want to come back here because, you know, I said this thing, I'm not coming back to I'm yeah, famous yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't even known. <laughs> I wasn't anyone. I was just some kid giving it a crack. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I decided to go uh, live in uh, England. My cousin lived there. So I went and stayed with her for a couple of weeks and then I stayed there two years, you know, and then I ended up playing in pubs there, like just solo and stuff, you know, in a little pub every now and then. And... Um, and then when I travelled around uh, Europe with a band, I was like tour managing a band around Europe. That was really good fun. It was just like going up the coast here in Australia. You know, it wasn't anything special. So I did that for a while, then came back, and then yeah, I just I went. To, I remember going to Greece because I always wanted to go to Greece since I was a kid. When you're a young kid in schools here, you do uh, projects, you know, and you get a country and you get like a big piece of like you know, I think it's almost A1 paper. And I'd always do it on Greece every single time. I had this infatuation with Greece, so I went there. But when I came back, I had a um, I had a dodgy ticket back to Australia. So as I'm going through customs, I had one week left on my visa. And they're like, well, what, what are you doing? I said, oh, well, I've got a job. They're like, well, you need to prove it. I'm like, well, I've got a job here. And I, you know, I've just got one week and I'm going to leave in a week. It's all fine. They're like, well, we don't believe you. <laughs> so they literally said, well, I'm sorry, that's it. You, know, you, have, to, well, you have to stay here. We're going to fly out of the country. They're going to keep me out of the country in 24 hours. And I was like, guys, I've got, I've got a unit here. Like I, I live here. I've been here for two years, you know. So they called up the place where I said I worked. And I actually wasn't working there. And I called on a pay phone and got someone to say, listen, if someone calls you, because they had a pay phone in there, believe it or not, where I was. And then they got the cleaner instead. He goes, oh, no, Tony doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> so they can say, listen, we've checked and you're bullshitting. You don't work at that place. I said, well, I used to, but, you know, I kind of left, you know. I said, look, I really need to stay here. So they let me stay for a week. They took my passport. They said, you've got to be at the airport next week. My birthday, on oh, my fucking birthday, mate, September 14. So I went to the airport, picked up my passport, and they kicked me out of the country. And that was it. And I didn't know where to go, you know, so I ended up coming back to Sydney. My best mate lived here. So I thought, well, I'll come back here. I had no money. I had a girlfriend I had to leave behind, you know. Back she, in UK? Yeah, she oh, called sure. me a month later and said, I think I'm pregnant. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Don't be telling me you think you're pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. I'm not, I can't even come back. I but heard yeah, that, how did that and she, out? she wasn't pregnant. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, okay. she saw she was, you know. But um, that was freaky because I couldn't do anything about it, you know. Yeah. But, uh, we totally lost contact and stuff. But I moved straight here to Bondi. It's the first place. I've been here ever since. Yeah. Well, I live in Potts Point for a bit at the beginning, you know, and then um, moved down here. I got a, a job at a place called Liberty Lunch. It's kind of infamous for being a party joint and having a few issues happen there. But um, Sounds like the exact sort of place you'd end up in. Yeah, totally. to be fair, right? <laughs> I was just attracted towards trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so how has um, Bondi changed over the years, mate? Um, well, I, you know, that whole thing, gentrification, has definitely happened here. You know, I think the the that kind of beach vibe here has changed. It's like a, it's a lot more, I don't know, it's one that's a lot more expensive, you know. And I think the the... I think back then it was just a lot more open. It wasn't so many rules and regulations and stuff because it wasn't really on the map as much, you know. You could get away with a lot of shit here, you know. But, I mean, down at the old, you know, the, the Bondi Hotel, you go in there, there's a back bar there. A lot of Kiwis used to be in there, all the Maori boys. And uh, you go in there and they'd have, like, little 50s of weed under the bar and stuff. It was quite well known for that. It was, yeah, it was, it was a different kind of joint back then, you know. But, um, and it was, and the bars are more fun. You could be a bit more loose. And there weren't so many rules and regulations. But now... I think a lot of people have moved into Bondi that, you know, oh, I want the quiet life. It's like, well, it doesn't happen here, you know. Well, it does, but they've said you can't do this and you can't do that and they complain about restaurants and noise and this. So it's become a bit of a – I think New South Wales is a bit of a nanny state, but Bondi has become a lot more a lot more tight, you know, up its own ass kind of vibe, you know. I've been here in Bondi for about uh, – coming up four years now yeah. and, like, it's just – my time here, it's never had a nightlife. Did it ever have like a good nightlife? Well, it did. There was a place called White Revolver a long time ago. Uh, that was kind of a place oh, that yeah. went till about two in the morning. Leah Simmons was yeah, telling us about that place, mate. It's fucking dodgy. <laughs> that little private room out the back. Where was that? <laughs> that was, um, God, how long ago was that? That was, that was when I was doing shows at the Beach Road. So that was 12, uh, was probably 14, 15 years ago at least, you know? So it was just, it, had, it was the one place that had like a, had a 24 hour license. So it was the only place that went late. So where was it in Bondi? Uh, just uh, where, where, you know, where, um, uh, what is it, the public bar is now? Yeah. Bondi Public Bar, that's where it was. 
Oh, it was public barracks? Yeah, with the public barracks, yeah. That's where it was, yeah. And that and used to was, be the spot? That was like the place you'd go to after, yeah, because everything was shut and you didn't want to go to the Bondi Hotel. No. And it was like, you know, a lot of, a lot of naughty shit went on in there. <laughs> it was pretty nuts, yeah. Right. Yeah. Part of me wishes I was here a bit earlier to it experience was, was, all of that. It was kind of fun back then, you know? Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It was just it was just a bit more looser and, as I say, not so many rules and regulations, whereas now it's like, yeah, you can't do this. It's just everything's a bit more, you know, yes sir, no sir, which kind of kills it a bit. That's why the community vibe I find here is like it's still here, but it's not as as obvious as it used to be. You know, it's a really big community. And then I think slowly as gentrification has happened, it's kind of like lost it a bit. But there's still, you know, there is still a community vibe. It's just, yes, yeah, it's just not as obvious as it used to be, from what I can say. Fair enough, mate. Look, uh, for those watching on the video, we're actually, you'll notice that we're actually filming in Tony's Bondi restaurant today. Tony, you've just opened the Enmore place. How's it going so far, mate? It's a tough gig. I won't lie, it's a tough gig. It's, uh, I'm, out, I'm, I'm just, I'm out of my comfort zone. Completely out of my comfort zone, you know. So I've got to, I've got to think outside the box on how to get people in there. Like we're doing well. Friday, Saturday nights are great. The venue itself is doing really well. But you know, obviously, I want it to do better. But I'm trying to figure out how to take it to the next level, you know. And I've got to just rethink how I do marketing. Like here, I got lucky. I, li you know, I lived here, you know. So when I opened, all my friends came. So it was always busy from get go. But I don't know anybody out there, you know. So I've got to just. Yeah, I've got to rethink how I'm going to promote it, market it, you know, manage it, you know. I've got an amazing business partner. He's more well-known than me because he used to do TV, so everyone knows him. So that's kind of a bonus. But, um, but yeah, for me, it's, 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 going to, it, it's going to be tough, but it's going to be really rewarding once I figure it out and I do get it packed. I will get it packed like this place without fail. That's my mission. But it's, I've, I've got to, yeah, I've just got to rethink how I do things and that's going to be a challenge. But when I achieve my goals is going to be very rewarding you know so it's going to be a big learning process so that means it'll be easy when we do number three number four number five you know it's always i call it second venue syndrome you know it's a bit like a band you know you some bands have got their whole life to write their first album you know and you know i mean i've a lot of bands have written great first albums and then the pressure's on for the second one you know like fuck okay we're gonna write this one in you know it depends if they get a deal or not you know i gotta write this one in two years or you know whatever and i think when the pressure's on you know obviously there's gonna be some cracks you know but so I think that's with the venue as well. It's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you, you have expectations with the second one. Whereas I had no expectations here. I just opened this up and rolled the dice and went, fuck, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, I'm fucked. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> that was what was going to happen, you know. I had a business before this and lost a bit of coin in that. So I was pretty much scraping the bottom of the barrel and opened this one up. Wow. So in, realistically, if this didn't work, I was in a pretty bad position, you know. So, but it, the stars aligned, you know, big time. So that's... So, as I say, you know, I was lucky with this one. So, Enmore is going to be more challenging. I don't have, you know, the network around me out there, you know, so I've got to build it. So, I'm doing something completely new, you know, 53 years old, you know, and that's, it's exciting, you know, it's, 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 it's hard, but it's exciting, you know. Like, I, I, was, I was a bit down at the beginning when we opened because I was always going out there and I, I managed both venues still, you know, so it was tough at the beginning, you know, kind of went into, well, to be honest, I went to a little bit of depression. I got a bit like just... I started doubting myself that I couldn't do it twice, you know, because, and then you start, oh, it was the first one a fluke, you know, all these, all this shit goes through your head, you know, you're just, you're just, you're just not centered, you know. But then I came out of it and now I'm like, okay, let's, you know, I was in that for about, about five weeks. I just couldn't figure it out. I just thought, this is just not going to work, you know, this is not going to happen, you know. Even though it was doing well, I was just putting too much pressure on myself. Oh, this should be full straight away. Well, no, it's not, mate. You're out of your comfort zone. You don't know anymore, you know, you don't know anyone out here. So you're going to have to just, as I say, just keep planting seeds and eventually have a forest, you know. But that's going to take time, you know. But, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been challenging on that level as well. Not just emotionally, financially, but, well, more emotionally it's been challenging than any other time, you know. Financially it's fine. We can afford to do it. I don't mean like, you know, we can afford to do it. Like, we, you know, we can, you know, we went a lot over budget on it too because we really want it to be special, you know. Like, we, we you know, we, when we took it over, we took over a lease. So we didn't, um, we didn't get a new lease. So no free rent period, you know, we had to re rewire the whole venue, no help from the landlord, you know, which he wasn't obligated to do that, you know, really cool guy, but he wasn't obligated to do that. So we just had to keep putting in money and making sure, you know, when we open it, it's the best it can possibly be. And it's an amazing venue. It looks, it looks, it looks so sick, mate. And it's great space, you know, and it's in a great corner. We just got to get it like this, you know, and that's just going to take time, you know. I've yeah. been in, man. It looks incredible. And yeah. all those little private rooms at the back look yeah. really, really cool as well. Yeah, it's like the bar, you know. There was a house next to my place in Bondi in Castlefield that was getting knocked down. And I went over one morning and I said to the guy, look, can I, can I get all the wood from the roof? 
He's like, what do you mean? I said, oh, I'm building a, I bought a bar, you know, out in Emmore and I want to, I want to build a bar out of wood from Bondi, you know, from this place. And it was all this Oregon and hardwood. And um, it was this, um, this Asian crew and the guy come up and um, he, he was just like, yeah, no worries. You know, he didn't speak very good English and we kind of communicated a little bit. And um, <laughs> I just said, look, I want the wood. He was trying to understand what I was doing. I was like, mate, I just want to, just want to build this bar. He's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I get it, I get it. And the next day he had all the wood out the front of the venue all piled up for me. So okay. I was like, are you sure? He goes, no, I understand you're trying to build a bar and you want wood, so there's all your wood. I was like, wow. Anyway, I mean, they're becoming kind of mates. Every time I go past, I say hi to him and I take him at lunch every now and then to say thanks, yeah. So we built the bar out of the wood from the house in Bondi. We like built a resin bar. All the furniture out there, apart from two tables, is all recycled from the roof in Bondi. Yeah, so it felt good to build everything, you know, from scratch. So you built everything? No, we had two guys help us. Yeah, carpenters yeah, yeah. or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So they, they again, they you know they they fell in our lap quite easily. Well, quite luckily, they fell in our lap. These two guys. One guy just come back from overseas and he was into like retro stuff and into like doing up old places, and he had two weeks up his sleeve. And then he called another mate, and it's called Ollie and Ben. These two dudes, absolute legends. And they came out and they were just the right people to build it because they actually gave a shit. Yeah. You know, we had another guy come in, but I think when someone's going to build, you, you know, your second venue and your passion you got to have a connection with him, you know. And we had a connection with this guy, Ben. He walked in. I'm like, yeah, that's a dude straight away. He's my so, Yeah, t- I knew straight away. As soon as I met him, I was like, yeah, he's a bloke straight away. Then he brought in a mate of his, Ollie, and we started building. So we got the keys October 7 and then just started building for two months. And I was there every single day, like up at 5 o'clock, Monday to Friday. It was it was intense, you know. But it's I feel proud of it because we built it, you know, obviously with help, you know. But we didn't just have someone build it for us. It's our blood, sweat and tears and our hard work, you know. So it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of me and Stevie in it, you know, my amazing business partner. So he was there every day, helped me too, you know. So, but um, it's one of those things I couldn't have done it by myself. No way. I always wanted a partner to do it with. So I asked him, and he's like, "Yeah, I'll do it with you." So I'm, I'm glad I have something to do it with. So I'm gonna share the highs and lows with you. I don't think I, I couldn't have done it by myself. No way. Yeah. And what, why and more, Tony? Um, well, one, it's got you know, there's a lot of music culture out there. You know, I look, look originally I wanted to do Kuji. That was my first option, um, but there's just not as many options in Coogee. So I got a call, it was a Friday night, I got a call from a guy who a couple of years ago was looking for a property for me when I was thinking of doing another one before COVID hit and everything went belly up. And um, he said, listen, Tony, there's this place out in Emmore. It's not on the market yet, but if you want it, you need to come now. I was like, okay. So I went out and saw him, told me the price. I was like, well, what's a catch here? This is way too cheap. You know, like what's going on here? And... Um, it, I mean, obviously it was cheap because there was a lot to do to it, you know. But um, so I looked at it and again, I walked in and went, yeah, this is the place. Because it's like this place, it's, 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 it's northwest facing, it's on a corner, you know, it's just, and it gets all the afternoon sun out. Do it. It's literally a replica of this joint, it's just bigger. It looks you know, great, no, <coughs> it looks great though, no, mate. Like, yeah, yeah, really yeah, we put really a lot is. of love into it, mate. It's all, the attention in the detail, you know. 100%. It's like the bathrooms, everyone, you know, people take pictures of the bathroom here. Now, to me, if people are taking pictures of your bathroom and putting them on social media, you fucking made it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I believe, you know. So I spent a lot of time in the bathrooms out there, you know, like built, I built the, um, the taps and the, all the things for it. So in a lot of Australian backyards, you have um, like, you know, you have like a piece of wood coming out of the ground and just a, like a copper tap coming out of it. So I wanted that to be, I had a vision of that, you know, being in the bathrooms. So again, you know, we spent our time, you know, made, like carved all the wood out and all that sort of stuff, and bought the taps and shit like that, and we put them in. It looks amazing, and you know, it's good because everything. It's all. There's just so many stories of it. We did this because of this reason. We did this because of this reason, you know. And I like going to the bathroom and saying, "I'll oh, see these. I built these." You know, like. But that's exactly what you did when we came in. You yeah. gave us the tour, and you're like, yeah, yeah. "Check out these fucking taps, yeah, mate." Absolutely, <laughs> mate. You know, and it's just a sense of pride, you know, because if you. You feel a sense of ownership because you've 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 been in there, you've built it, you've done the hard yard, you know, you've slogged the you fucking slogged it out building it. So uh, you feel like you're a part of it, you know. It's a bit like when I did this place, you know, like I built everything here, you know, like I built this from scratch, you know. And I feel there's there's a there's a sense of pride in this as well, you know, there's a real connection to this venue, you know, and if I feel a connection to it, customers come in and feel a connection, you know. You can't bullshit. And like if I, I had somebody else build this, it would I don't think it would have worked, you know. But we did it, you know. My mum and dad come up and helped me, you know. So out there we had friends come out and help us every now and then, which is great. So there's a part of us in every nail, every piece of wood, every chair. It's, it's a good little area. There's a, there's a good community out there too. All the restaurants would come and I say, good luck, good luck. Or we'd open up and people would go, yeah, we've been seeing you guys scrubbing and building. So they could see that we were, we were, we were you know, we, we were grafters. 
you know, they could see we'd done it. So I think they were like, oh, these guys are doing it themselves and maybe, you know, maybe it's going to work or maybe, you know, maybe they're, you know, they're not just out here just to make a quick buck and fuck off, you know. I was like, no, we want to we want to be part of the community. We want to build something really cool that everyone can come into and enjoy, you know, and bring their kids in and, you know, bring their grandkids in and, you know. I've seen people in here with which had kids and now they're born, like being pregnant, now they're born and they're sitting in baby chairs and, you know, we've named a burger after one of the kids, you know. Like it's, that's, they, they're part of it too. And we're trying to try to build that out there, you know. And again, it'll just take time for that to happen. Beautiful, mate. Yeah. Look, Tony, before burgers, it was music industry, managing yeah, and promoting, yeah, promoting yeah, bands. How, yeah. did that, how did that come about? Um, that came about actually, funnily enough, from going to Vipassana. It's a meditation camp up in the Black Mountain, Blackheath. And what you do is you basically, um, I'd never done meditating in my life, ever. My mate said, listen, you want to go to this camp for 10 days, you don't talk. I'm like, dude, I can't shut the fuck up. How am I going to do that? And he's like, no, come up and do it. So I did it with my best friend. And they put us in the same room. There was a room of like 10 people. So they have like, um, it's called a passion. It's, all, it's worldwide. It's amazing. Like it just really centers you. 10 days, no talking. 10 days, no talking. Yeah. So you get up at like four in the morning. Um, you go and meditate for three hours. You come back, you have breakfast. You have about an hour to yourself. You go back and meditate for three, four hours. Come back, have lunch, meditate three, four hours. And then um, you're in bed by like sort of like six, seven o'clock. And you get up at four o'clock in the morning. Do that for 10 days straight. Yeah. And it's, it's intense. It's intense. And then I think it was on the seventh day I... Um, that's when everything sort of because like, like anything happens in your life, it creates a blockage in you, okay, and you hold on to that until you release it. And I've had a lot of shit going in my life, you know, so I had a lot of blockages, you know. So doing that, it allowed my body to completely and utterly go into like complete calm, and all of a sudden everything came to the surface. And on the seventh day, I remember sitting there meditating, and I just started like I was going to throw up, you know. And I went outside and literally held on to the side of this little concrete slab, and literally just bore my eyes out for like twenty minutes. Like, literally, I had snot from my nose to the ground. People coming out couldn't say anything to me. They're going, you know, I'm like, you know, that kind of thing. And um, and I still had those three rocks of all the snot was going on, which I, I kept and cleaned and they're in my bedroom, <laughs> funnily enough. But um, And then after that happened, I was just like, what the fuck? It was like I felt so light and so amazing. I was like, holy shit. I just felt like everything had been released from me. And I've never cried like that in my life. We're talking like crying like... Your whole family's been slaughtered in front of you, you know. Like it was, it was intense. I was like, I just, I couldn't stop, mate. It was the most insane. You're releasing stress and trauma, oh, mate. Yeah, it like was, and that stuff oh, you don't even know. It's stuff intense, that's like buried deep mate. inside. It was intense. I've never experienced that in my life. And the next three days, oh, mate, I was astral traveling. I was meditating and I was moving around the room. It was, I was on another planet, mate. You know, it was. I remember sitting there meditating. And I was literally, obviously, you know, my eyes closed. I'm sitting there. And I'm like, I'm literally. Meditating like I'm, my eyes are open and I'm just I'm just cruising, floating around the room and stuff. It was fucking insane, bro. So I've been up for about three refresher courses. But after that happened, I came back and I was like, you know what? I'm going to be a promoter. I'm going to get into music. And I was playing. I thought, I'm going to start doing my own shows. So I went down to uh, 34B up the road here, contacted the guy. was called Motion back then. Went to the guys and said, look, I want to do a show downstairs. You know, they're like, I should know the first thing we did with my mate, called Roy Delicious. We got a whole bunch of crew together at the end of uh, Francis Street. There's a cul-de-sac and there's a little scout hall there. Yeah. So we went and saw them and we put on the show for 90 people and just put an acoustic show on. It was three big beautiful tables and rose petals everywhere and candles. And I had three musicians, a guy called uh, Wolfie, um, Cass, Cass Eag. I think her album's up there actually. It's up there, her album. Ca um, Cass, it wasn't Cass. It was, fuck, I can't remember her name again. Anyway, it was a long time ago. Yeah, and um, Cassie was another girl I worked with. And um, we did that, and then it was such a rush coming out. It was like, yeah, I, I want to keep doing this. So when was this? What year? This, was, um, this would have been about 20 years ago, at least. So yeah. early 2000s? Yeah, early 2000s, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, early 2000s. And then um, we did the show, and I basically, you know, you go out, you go to a party or something, and some guy picks up a guitar. You know, he's never played in front of anybody, but he's been home practicing for ages, and he's got, you know, had a few drinks, he's feeling a bit confident. Picks up guitar and you're like, Jesus, fuck, dude, you're a really good singer, man. Or they sing one song they've, you know, been singing the whole freaking life, you know. You're like, that's, man, that's a really good fucking song. I'm like, think, well, maybe I should get this place called 34B and put people like that on the stage, you know, who, and guess what they do? They always bring like 20, 30 mates because it's the first time they played, you know. So we get three, four artists on, we charge five bucks at the door and then we get the door at the end, we just split it four ways. And they'd all bring in like 20, 30 mates and we'd put them on stage and they'd just do three, four songs. That's it. Cover and a couple of originals, you know. Everyone's got two or three originals if you're um, you know, up and coming guitarist, so to speak. And you always got a couple of covers. 
So yeah, they just had like a 15, 20 minute set and it got really, really busy. Like it got packed every, it was every Wednesday. So just in and around Bondi? Yeah, just in Bondi. It was called Acoustic Motion, you know? And that's how the Bondi Tony name started because my email was Tony, Bondi Tony at yahoo.com because Tony at yahoo.com was taken, funnily enough. So I just put Bondi in front of it and was emailing people. And this is when databases weren't really that popular. And I was collecting emails, inviting people to the show, you know, come on to the show. Saying, man, give me email, I'm going to start the show, you know. So I started like a little database, so to speak, you know, with people. And, um, yeah, it got really popular, like, like packed. Everyone wanted to play it. And we had like, at one stage we had the guy from the Foo Fighters, the guitarist of the Foo Fighters, came down and did a set and a couple of other big people because I knew one of the guys at, um, I think it was, a guy at um, a Harbour or something, and he wanted to do a little acoustic show. Was that Taylor from the Foo Fighters? The no, guy I can't remember the guy's name. It was, no, no, no. It was the um, uh, blonde sort of guy that plays guitar, lead guitar. Um, I can't remember his name. A long time ago. Yeah. He's still with him. Yeah. Okay. So when that happened, that kind of put it on the map a little bit. You know? Yeah. So that really helped, obviously. Was that the moment? It was like, oh, this is actually... Yeah, I was always doing well, you know, because I wasn't... I didn't want it to rely on, you know, someone big to put it on the map. You know, I wanted it to be more organic than that. You know, like, oh, now someone big's here, it's going to be popular. It did get a bit busier after that, definitely, you know, after he played. Um, but And more people wanted to play the room a bit. But it's, not, it's a small room. It's not very big, you know. But And that got bigger. And then I was like, you know what, I want to, I want to start bigger shows. So I went on tour with a band called Cog who's the burgers named after Classic Cog. And I said, listen, can I, because I want to work with bigger acts, you know, and, and find a place to do bigger shows, you know, with bands and not solo artists. Were they already established, Cog? Were they, Cog like uh, they, they were really popular at the time. Okay. Yeah, really popular. They were, they were just one of Australia's hardest working bands. They were cruising up and down the coast and, you know, getting, you know, the sell out like the corner house in Melbourne. So they're getting seven, 800 people to show. More so in Melbourne, because Melbourne, you know, like Melbourne's sort of, you know. Sort More of, of a scene down there. Yeah, yeah, you do a show in Melbourne, you probably do, tw you do one show here, you do two in Melbourne, you know, do two here, you do three in Melbourne kind of vibe. You know, there's people kind of, you know, every time you sold tickets, Melbourne would sell more. Not that I did ticketed shows down there, but generally speaking to people. But, um, so I just went on, I said, look, can I go on tour with you guys? Because I want to see it from a band's perspective when you get to a venue and how you get treated and, you know, how how you walk in. So I went on tour with them and just just wrote notes the whole time. Just like, you know, okay, when they do this and they do this and when they're on the road, what they talk about and what they expect when they get to a venue. And I just took notes and notes and notes and just learned from them. So I travel all the way around down to Melbourne and back with them. And then on the way, we because we I knew the guys anyway, because we used to landscape together years ago. And I knew the guys and I said, we've got to come up with a name, you know. And Lukey, who's the bass player, said, mate, it's got to be a filthy name. And we're like, that's it. Let's call it the filth. Like that quickly. We're just fucking around. I was like, that's it. Let's call it the filth. So I fucking got the Melbourne. I registered the filth.com.au and uh, came back and went to. Uh, that so was the name of the promotion company? Tony, yeah, was the... my company. Yeah, my company's called The Filth. Yeah, like there's all this stuff up here. Oh, like yeah. my filthy riot, filth, like the filth, <laughs> this one, filth. I even got it tattooed on me. So that was the name of the company. Like all these things, the filth presents, the filth presents. Like this one, we did a show in Melbourne, The Filth, you know. So good. Yeah, yeah so it started from that. And then <clears throat> I couldn't, I saw a band called The Cops Play at, um, at uh, uh, where is it? Uh, the Newtown Festival. And I walked out and I thought, that's the band to open up The Filth. That's the first band that can open it for me, you know. And um, I saw them and I was just like, fuck, it wouldn't be cool. And I thought, because the, the Soho was in The Cross. So I had this tagline, The Cops Get Filthy in The Cross, you know. And that was the tagline for the business. And I, I couldn't get the band. They would because I was new on the scene. So the agencies are like, nah, you're not having this fucking band. You're a new kid. Like, this is a good band, you know. And I just happened to know a guy called BT who happened to be good mates with um, Andy Kent, who was a bass player for UMI. He was working for him and he was managing the cops. So I'd done a favour for BT a long time ago. So when I went and saw him, BT's like, look, you know, give Tony the band. Like, he's a good bloke, you know, he's just trying to get started. So then Andy Kent gave the agency a call, Brett Murray, he, he was their agency at the time, and said, okay, yeah, Tony can have the cops. And I was like, yeah, I fucking got him. <laughs> so that was, it was important to get them. Like, that was, that was the whole vision. And I just envisioned it. I, I, you know, I just, I basically manifested it and it happened. It's a bit like me getting you in the podcast, Tony. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> took you six months <laughs> just because I'm all over the shop. <laughs> so that's how that came about. And then we started it and, you know, it was, it was that thing of like, you know, I used to build a stage every week because there's no stage in there. So I had, I got a whole bunch of plywood and milk crates and every week I'd pull it apart, you know, I had holes in it, you know, because I couldn't have it all down. So I had to put the wood had to go in this little area. So I had to take all the milk crates off, built the stage every week, every single, it's every Wednesday. And it went well, but it just got a bit too hard financially, you know. So then we went to Lady Lux, another place in the cross for a little while. And then eventually we ended up at the Beach Road. Yeah. So we were there for, I think, five, five six years, doing every Wednesday. At the every Beach Wednesday Road. night. Every up, Wednesday. Upstairs, upstairs in the Beach Road? Yeah. And that's when people would come to the show. Like we had, we had a lot of bands coming to town. And it was that thing of like, 
a lot of bands would always talk about how they got treated like shit on the road. You know, you go to a venue and it's like, there's your beer, there's your room, have fun. And just be like, hold on, this is, this is your entertainment. This is the people that are going to entertain your crowd. Maybe show them a bit of fucking respect or just be nice to these guys. So I just did what anybody did. When they came, I'd take them out to dinner, you know, lunch, the, the, little bit, um, the main act, and um, show them their room, take care of them, take them out afterwards and stuff, and just, just did what you do to anybody. Like, it's like, you know, it's like they come to my house for dinner, you know, like the guests of mine. And the, more, the, be the better I treated them, the better they played. They're like, you know what, fuck, let's put on a show for this cat. This cat's treating us really well. And, and that kind of went around because I think just – Everybody was doing was, was not treating like because they're up and coming bands, you know. At, this, at that time, they were just you know, just a band, you know. Some of the bands got really big, like Gang of Views, Jezebels, Dune Rats. All those guys played there. Tame Impala did their first ever show there, you know, ever in Sydney, you know. So just treating them just like you'd treat anybody that came to your place. Hey, how you doing? You know, you got a show? Cool. I'm Tony. I'm the owner. I'm the booker. Or the, you know, the promoter. This is what's going to happen. We're going to have dinner, da da da. Have a great show. Take him out to White Revolver later. <laughs> we walk in the front, in the front door, go to the private room. Be naughty boys, and um, and so all the bands wanted to play the show because they're like, yeah, go play this show. And it was a game. It was free to get in as well. So you know there was a, there was a guaranteed crowd. So we get like eight, nine hundred people every Wednesday night, packed upstairs, just there for the music. You know, and how much were you buying the bar then? Because that's mm -hmm. all, if it's free to get in, there beach road are like, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, oh, they do. I mean, I, I didn't get paid very much. I tried to get a pay rise, and you know, they told me to fuck off. But um, so it, uh, we packed it out every single week. So it became a real big thing for bands to play. We had Spider Bait play there. Like just so many bands. I think there's even like, well, that's one of the posters over there. You can't see it, but that's got. He's got. It's got on the Los Valentinos, Mess Hall, um, uh, Tame Impala, Jezebels. Dukes of Windsor. Look, we had some cassette kids. We had some good bands play there. Yeah. Really good bands, you know. So, and it just went, it was just really popular. And was it a draw for these bands, the fact that they were coming to play this gig in Bondi? Yeah, and also because we got out, you're going to play to a full room and you, don't, and you don't really even have to promote it. He's got an automatic crowd. So, I mean, obviously we'd ask him to put it on, I think it was MySpace back then, you know. But when you got, you know, and you got, they got paid on time, they got paid well, they got fed, they got taken out. It was just like, let's, let's play that show. You know, it's, it's it's a good gig and it's a fun gig and it's, you know. We get a so, night out in Bondi after. And they get out in Bondi, you know. And they could go play the Oxford Arts Factory. I don't think the Oxford Arts Factory was that then. It was something else. But they go play, um, a Q, there was a place called Cuba. There was a 200-person uh, a venue there. So they go play that and then play this. But the, the crowd, it didn't it didn't bastardise the crowds. You know, like these people wouldn't go there because they had to pay. And those people wouldn't come here because it was too far. It was Bondi, you know. So we just had a massive Bondi crowd and just every week we just had good bands on. And we created an amazing community. Everyone came up and it was it was pretty awesome, man. Yeah. For five years we did that. It was next level. So where's that community going now? Because I don't see any of that in Bondi. Or yeah, or I know. That's, that's, what, that's what I mean. It's like it's it, – it is there, but it's kind of – it's kind of <sighs> – I think it's someone who's traveling here or as a tourist, I'm not saying you're a tourist, you know, but someone who's, who's living here from overseas, you kind of don't see it, but it's, it's just there. And that's the funny thing, you kind of don't see it as much as you used to, you know, like the beach road at now is everyone gets pre-fueled up before they go to see an act play. You know, they don't go there because most people go on there, you know, pick up anyway, you know, on Wednesdays. I mean, it used to be like that a while ago. I haven't been there for ages, but um, it, um, and I mean, Sundays down there at the beach road used to be the, the local night. All the locals go down. You want to? Go, I want to see everybody. Go there on Sundays. It was huge on Sundays, you know. But there's no real place like that, you know. That's sort of community. The Beaver does that. The, you know, the stuff Beaver up the road. Yeah, they've got a real kind of like cool little community up there with all locals and young kids and stuff. That's a pretty good job. I pretty much live there. <laughs> the only burger I eat outside of mine is the stuff Beaver. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So yeah. you were promoting um, in in Bondi, Tony. But. Did you go on tour with any of these bands as well? Um, yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. Well, I used to manage Jezebels for a while, so we'd take them down to uh, Melbourne, uh, Brisbane, and then another band called Z Horse, you know. So ma I mainly only did Sydney. We tried to do Melbourne, but it was just too tough. So the idea was to do the filth in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane, so that if a band wanted to play, they could play all three shows. So we started to do Melbourne, and it was just, it was tough. We did a place called the Ding Dong, which is about 400 people. It was a really cool venue, and this girl used to run it. And it was, it was just too tough doing interstate, you know. But that was the idea. And then, you know, start like a little label and do a fill fest. We end up doing the festivals, you know, but just couldn't really get it going to the next level, you know. Um, not sure why, I just, yeah, just couldn't get it going to the next level. And I think I kind of left the beach road, you know, so I lost that that sort of like indie kind of thing I was doing because it was all indie bands and I went up to the Beresford and um, I got poached to go to the Beresford and start upstairs Beresford for, for Maryvale. 
And you're putting gigs on up there as well? Yeah, well, they just, I they just, you know, the beach show wasn't paying me enough. I was packing the room out. I was just like, guys, I'm worth a lot more money. They didn't think so. I'm like, okay, well, then I'm out of here. See ya. So I went and was um, the uh, entertainment manager for the um, Beresford upstairs. So my whole gig was to get it going and get it started. And Justin had heard from me through, they had a company called Good Vibrations. It was a festival. And he'd heard, or no, girl called, girl, girl, girl called Jane English had heard from uh, one of the agencies. I told he's not really happy down the beach road. They're not really treating him right. And uh, when I say negative treatment right, I just, I wanted more money and they couldn't justify. And I'm sure they had their reasons for not doing it, but I didn't agree with him, so I left. But, um, and then went to the Beresford and they put me on, I had my own company, so I just consulted to them. I was making much more money there and had this brand new room, you know, and just ended up doing bands there. And again, it was a really good room, like next level. The, the green room was like pimped out to the max. Again, every band got paid good money. You know, they got treated like royalty. And I just had to sit back and people just gave me all the bands, you know. If, if, if an agency had a new band they wanted to see how, how they sounded, they'd always showcase them at the Beresford because the sound was so good. You know, they could really see what they sounded like on a good system. And they got treated really well. So I went over there and for four years, I did that venue for four years. And it was amazing. It was a killer, man, it was the most insane gig, you know. And working with Justin was just, that was the next level, you know. So four years there was like going back to college. You what, know? A, what story from that entire time working in the music industry, Tony, what story stands out in your head the most? Oh, must, be, must be a few good ones, a few, few um, big nights. Out. I think it would have been getting on stage at Splendor. Yeah, <laughs> we're a side of stage. We had triple A's and we're a side of stage at Splendor. And um, Ke um, Grinspoon uh, were playing and I was off chops. I, was, I, was, I think I dropped a pill or something. I can't remember. I was off my tits. <laughs> this is like years and years ago. And I was side of stage. I looked at my mate and said, and there was no one on the stage at the time. And uh, Grinspoon had just, I know I was side of stage and I was like yelling out to Pat, his guitarist, you know, and apparently Triple J recording it and he's playing. I'm trying to yell, hey, Pat. He's like, Tony, he's, he's playing guitar. He's like, Shut the fuck up, man. I'm trying to play. And because uh, I was mates with the boys and um, they left, got off stage. And I looked at my mate and I said, dude, and no one was on stage. I said, I'm going to go on stage and I'm going to talk to the crowd. And my mate's like, dude, you can't fucking do that. I'm like, fucking watch me. So I went onto the stage and uh, there was no one on there. It was all like, you know, all the roadies and stuff hanging around. And I picked up the microphone and was like, hello, hello. And I was, gosh, so fucked. And there was no volume on it. So I dropped the mic, <laughs> went to the next mic, went, hello, hello. And my mate's the next stage going, mate, you're going to get kicked out of the fucking festival. And I went to the next mic and it was volume. I was like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> My name's Tony. I run the filth. It's a killer fucking rock show. Have a good day. And, and I just walked off stage and I didn't get kicked off. And I walked stage and then fucking Sonic Youth came on. And my mates went, I cannot believe you haven't been kicked out of the festival. And we sat on the side of the stage and watched Sonic Youth play. <laughs> and then I got to my mates saying, was that you on stage last night? I'm like, yeah, oh, fuck. <laughs> but that was pretty loose, man. Like, I think Splendor is one of those festivals where just anything goes, you know. But that was probably, when you say that, it's the first thing that comes to memory is yeah. doing that because it was just, I, the fact I got away with it. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I thought you were going to say I got on stage, picked up a guitar and started playing to the crowd, mate. No, no, no. I just spoke to the crowd and stuff. And then everyone later was like, what the fuck? And just literally, I cannot believe it. Kick, they thought I was one of the roadies because I was dressed in all black, you know? Yeah. So they thought, oh, just another roadie testing the mic. Giving off roadie yeah. vibes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, mate. So yeah, I got away with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, when did you stop in the music industry, Tony, and why? Um, uh, th uh, this venue. Well, why did you stop the? Why did oh, you stop? So, like so, so what, what happened was I was doing when I was doing the Beresford upstairs. Um, Justin had stopped doing Good Vibrations Festival because um, he just wanted to do DJs and uh, just it wasn't like it was still doing really well. But he just wanted to say, "Mate, what was going on?" He just wanted to do DJs. I was like, "Okay." So they said, "Look, we're going to stop the live music. We're going to move it to DJs only now." I think because you know it's a lot cheaper just doing DJs. You know, you save yourself like five, six grand a week in fees, etc. You know, and he's a smart businessman, so he saw. It's more beneficial, put DJs on, well, paying this and that. But anyway, so I was like, well, what am I going to fucking do? So they said, look, we'll make you operations manager for the venue. So I became operations manager. But then I was kind of on the books and I was kind of part of the management team. And I just... Bond Day 20 working for Maraville now, doesn't sound right. Does no, it? working the company was insane. It was next level, mate. Like, I, I swear to God, it was, it was... I fucking learned shitloads. I wouldn't have this venue if it wasn't for that joint. I just didn't want to go in the corporate world. You know, so I was basically just, yeah, it just after eight weeks, I was like, I just, you know, I wanted to work with Axe. I wasn't being creative. You know, I was running a pub, not running a pub. I was just too OC at the pub. And I just, it didn't click with me, you know. 
So I, uh, I felt really nervous about telling Justin. I was like, shit, you know. So I just emailed him and said, look, mate, I'm just, you know, I'm going to bail and I'm going to open up my own venue because I've learned so much from you, et cetera. And he was so supportive. He was like, mate, good on you. That's fucking awesome. I fully support you. So I left and found a bar, you know, in yeah. Not this one at start. Had a bar around the corner. It was called The Crossing. And I had two business partners that went belly up after three, four months. What happens? Oh, uh, just bad partnership breakup, mate. It just, I was... I just got not to with these two guys. They basically, they they got to a point where I had to sell some of my shares and they had a majority of the shares. So they kind of put their shares together and I kind of got pushed out, you know, and it was my idea. And it was, it looked like a fucking Hyatt bar. It wasn't a rock bar. I was totally out of, out of, out of place. And it wasn't making money. I said, guys, look, this is not what I want to do. This is not what I envisaged. Uh, I need, I need, you know, I want to do a, a burger, rock and roll. I need to do a bar, like a proper rock and roll bar, you know. So I, um, I uh, got my money off the guys, um, got more than what I should have got, which is great. <laughs> so that was good. So I had enough to open this joint, came around the corner and saw this was Felice. I was like, holy shit. This is, I walked, I looked at it and went, this is a place. And it was only 900 bucks a week rent. Was it? Nine, at the time, 900 bucks a week. Um, so I looked at this and went, yeah, this is a joint, you know. So, and there wasn't really any bars in Bondi that, you know, like, you know, I just thought well, my mates wanted to go to a cool little rock and roll bar. Let's do something like that. So I put burgers on it to kind of, you know, you had to do food, you know. So I just plastered it with burgers, but really it was going to be a little cool private bar, you so know. So the original idea, Tony, was uh, just a bar? Yeah, like, yeah. Totally. No, no, no burgers? And then no, you're no, like, well, I, I did burgers because they were easy. Yeah. You know, well, when I say they're not easy, but I was like, it's easy. I don't need chefs. I just need cooks. You know, I just need people to get on there and cook burgers. And um, the first week... <laughs> It was all about the food in the first week, you know, so we had to pretty much get more chefs in pretty quick and it turned into a burger joint really quickly because I spent a lot of time on the burgers, you know, like I didn't realise how, not when I say, yeah, how special I made them. I literally, for two months, just studied every top 10 burger joints in every state in Australia. I went through all the social media, I went through everything and just studied their menus because I had a lot of time off. So while I was building, so I was doing that. And then I just came through with this five burgers, I filtered it all down and... What dripped out was these five burgers that I started the venue with, which is actually the original menu up there. So it was only five burgers to start with. That's the first the original menu. There's only five burgers and three add-ons. Now we've got nine burgers and 20 add-ons. And they were like, what, $14.99 a burger? I think it was. Oh, yeah. Then. Yeah. And um, they came out and everyone loved it because everything was homemade. We made the guac. We made the coleslaw. My friend did the relish. My friend did the chutney. My friend did the fennel. My friend owned a bun company. My friend was a butcher. It was all my crew. And I think with all that combined, everybody just... I don't know, when you put so much effort into every little part of the process, you end up with a really good product. And that's what happened, you know, and it went ballistic, you know, but the stars aligned with this venue big time. You know, like this table, that table there, my dad found that piece of wood on the side of the road, brought it up and just got really smoked up a big spliffy one night and I like, carved it into this beautiful <laughs> table and look at it now. It's the main centerpiece of the venue. Still here, mate. Yeah. yeah. You know, these venue, this table here was a secondhand table, but everything just lined up. Like it was meant to be one of those things like, you know, and especially after having a business that didn't work because the other one wasn't working, you know. Well, doing there a week what we do here on a Sunday, like it was, it was didn't work at all because it was just, yeah, it was just wrong. But anyway. So you opened this place in 2015, Tony, and it just took off right away? Yes, yeah, straight away. Yeah, straight away from get-go. Yeah, like literally from like, I think what we did like maybe like my budget, the f- the first year I had a budget and we beat that by about 150% in the first year. It was nuts. It just – and the burger craze happened four months after we opened. There wasn't a burger craze. It was just the most insane timing. And when the burger craze happened, we were already a bit established, you know. So we're obviously in the top five list of a lot of burger joints, you know. But, um, yeah, it, it kicked off from get-go. And it's always been like, it's been like that for nine, for nine years now. It's always been busy this oh, time. it's always busy. It's fucking man. insane, mate. Insane, you know. But, again, that's community. It's building a culture. You know, I've got amazing staff, you know, that sometimes <laughs> can't put up with me because I'm a nightmare. But, but you know, hey, you know, it's, you're running a business, you know. You're not going to be everybody's mate. But I become friends with a lot of staff here. It's, you know, it's like a little family, you know. And, you know, and I've had my ups and downs and stuff, you know, but they've always, you know, a lot of them have always stuck with me, you know. But I'm a pretty intense owner because I, I, I demand perfection, you know. I demand good quality, you know. I demand that the customers trust me, you know. They know that if I say... That, that's organic honey. That's organic honey in the aioli. I could put any shit in there, but they know that if that's what he said, that's what he does, you know? And I think once you've got that trust of the customer, you've got them, you know? I don't mean like you've got them. Like they, they'll, they'll keep coming back because they trust you, you know? Like like I was saying about the bathroom, I put more effort into the bathroom than I did the whole freaking venue, you know? 
and people just go, wow, that bathroom's insane, you know? But, you know, like the right, I've got asthma, so you know, the right spray and the right toilet paper and the right, you know, just everything in there has got to be spot on, you know? It's got to be, the toilet's got to be an experience, you know? And I learned that from Maryville, you know? Because his bathrooms at every venue he has are immaculate. Some of his venues, you're just like, look at this bathroom, holy shit. Every detail from the vase to the, to the toilet holder to everything. You look at all these bathrooms, even his whole, whole venues. Everything's, everything's been thought about. Nothing's just, that wasn't just put there. That was discussed. A meeting was done over that. Everything, every detail. And I used that here. So that's, that's why I had the confidence to do this because of four years at Maryvale and having multiple meetings with Justin about upstairs and all that kind of things and just listening and learning and listening and learning and stuff, you know. And I had a really good relationship. I was really lucky, you know. He had time for me and I was, you know, I was blessed, you know. So if I needed to chat about the venue, I could call him and have a meeting about it, you know. But it was, um, so that experience is the reason, there's a lot of reasons why this worked, but that was definitely a big part of it, having the balls to do this after doing four years over there, you know. I, think, I don't think I would have had the um, organisational skills or the management skills or, or, or the business skills if I hadn't done my time at Maryvale. And I think that's why a lot of people, if you do four years there, you, you, you can open it. And even when we got the lease at the other venue, <clears throat> when I put down a resume and worked here, it was signed straight away. Yeah. That was a key. Oh, fuck, okay. Well, if he's done work Maryville for four years, Cat knows what he's doing, you know. So, so yeah, so I have a lot of uh, a big thank you to, to Justin for, you know, giving me four years of his time and doing this place. So, to be part of it. How difficult, Tony, was it during COVID? Um, funnily enough, it wasn't that difficult for us. Reason being, we, 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 we adapted really quickly. You know, we pretty much put on $10 margies, $5 wings, $5 nuggets and $5 beers. And those little things really brought everybody here, you know, because everyone was doing it tough. We're like, well, what can we, I didn't want to, I didn't want to make the burgers cheaper. I thought they can stand on their own two feet, but let's make the extras cheaper. You know, margies, 10 bucks. We're doing like 800 margies a week at one stage. Just to take away margaritas. Just to take away margaritas. Yeah. Next level. And we, as a staff member, we sat down with staff members and said, look, let's, um, how much do we all need to, because obviously our hours got cut right back, you know. So we just created a little family. I think, it was, I think some people left, some stayed. Um, I think we had a crew of about eight. And we said, okay, what does everybody need to earn per week? And let's give you those hours. I said, tell us, because obviously, you know, everyone needs to earn a bit of money and stuff. So we all decided on everyone's hours and I was here every day. And we just, we actually had a good time here during COVID. COVID sucked, obviously. But from a business point of view, we, we just, we adapted and made the most of it. And our DoorDash, we were a deliverer at the time, went through the roof, takeaway went through the roof. And that's when I really saw community. Like I, st I still have, I have a box of, and I'm going to put him in a collage one day. I have a box of people can write notes on DoorDash. You know, like you can write a little comment. The amount of comments we got, wishing you all the best, hope you're doing well, hope you're succeeding, it's extra. Mate, it was next level. We don't get any any more, you know, because you don't need to. But you could just see, like, I can't, there's probably maybe 100, 200 little notes that people have written, just like, you know, we're going to support you. We hope you do well. I was like, what the fuck? But yeah, I've kept them in a box. Yeah, so I'm going to make a collage one day. You know, and say, listen, if you ever wrote a note to me on Deliveroo during it, come in and get a free burger. <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, we, we had a lot of community support, massive. You know, it was it was it was it was really overwhelming how much people got behind us because we'd supported the community in return. You know, we sponsored Bondi Board Riders, we sponsored Bondi uh, United Footy Team. A lot of people, if they're doing like uh, you know, like kids are doing charities or something, we give away vouchers and stuff. So supporting them when we are in the shit, they supported us. It just, it, it totally came back to us. And that was really, that was, that was amazing to see. That's when I really saw community, you know, around here when, uh, when COVID hit, you know, but, but the business as a whole, we actually, we actually, we did well because we'll take away, you know, and I don't mean that, like, I don't want to talk too much about it because then other people didn't get through it, you know, with business and stuff, but we held our own, you know, and we got through it, you know, which is good. So yeah, it was, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be from a business point of view, you know, so we survived. That was part of my Friday night tradition during COVID, yeah, Tony. Yeah. Like me, me and my friends would get together every Friday night and we'd yeah, take away Bondi, Tony. Well, yeah, because you couldn't really go anywhere, nah. you know. So people would come down here and they'd get like four beers and go home or, you know, come down and just get wings and nuggets. So to come down and get a muggy wings and nuggets for 20 bucks, you know, a full fleet, you know. So it was, um, but yeah, then, the, then that, that margarita walk thing got busted and we lost our license for a week. That was unfair though, really fully unfair because, you know, we, we apparently got in trouble because someone had a lit off their drink or something like that. It was just, it was just over policed, mate, in a big time. So they just decided instead of controlling the people on the streets, you know, they'd shut the businesses down. So we got, they closed nine, I think nine, ten businesses, you know, and we didn't instigate the margarita walk. Somebody else did it, you know, but 
because we had Bondi on it. They used our name in all the press. You know, Bondi Tonys doesn't give a fuck. We had this one article, it was pedestrian, and I was with my mate and we are down the beach and we're watching the sunrise and it was two days after we'd lost our licence. And I was like, fuck, and we're doing really well with it. You know, we're selling so much booze. And I was down the beach, we went home and I said, mate, let's go watch the sunrise. You know, it is what it is. It's going to be a pretty quiet week at the venue. And I wrote down, you know, when I put the post up, you know, I wrote dot, dot, dot. And um, uh, what is it? Um, something like, um, uh, who, 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 who gives a fuck, you know? When I was, what I was saying is like, you know, I've got my life, I've got my family, I've got my kid, I've got, I've got a good business. At the end of the day, I lost my license, who gives a fuck, you know? Like, it's not the be all and end all. And then Pedestrian did an article on me saying, oh, this arrogant guy from Bondi doesn't give a fuck. Totally took it out of context. Like, it was a really bad article thinking I was this Bondi twat that, you know, can do whatever the fuck he wants. And I contacted him and said, guys, maybe you should look at the post I did the day before, which is telling people not to drink on the street, not to do this, to be careful, etc. Look at that post. And then you need to take this down. Or oh, seriously, this is this is bullshit, guys. This is this is not journalism, man. And um, they, I got called. My mate used to own. I got contact with the guy, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm fucking so sorry." I said, "Mate, come on, dude. Look at look at the stuff I put online, telling people to be safe and be careful." And then you've totally taken it out of context. You know, look, read what I said before giving a fuck. But you just wrote, "Doesn't give a fuck." You know, and then um, they uh, read, read the whole article. You know, and reposted the whole article with an apology. I, was I like, know Thank you're, you. you're not shy of that sort of thing, Tony. No, I, I've seen you know? I've seen you uh, repost things on your social media. Like if someone writes a fucking really shitty review, yeah, you'll you'll respond to them and go back yeah. at them, mate. I'll write, if, look, if it's an unjustified, yeah, 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 you know, like if someone calls in and said I went in there, the burger was really crap, I didn't have the best time, waitress was rude, blah blah blah. I'll write back, mate. I'm so sorry you had a bad day, you know. And a lot of times I'll leave my number. You know, I'm so sorry you had a bad experience. Obviously, you came here because you read the reviews. So don't take that one experience as how we actually run this business. But here's my number. Give me a call. You never offer free food online because anyone starts writing shit. I just say, give me a call. Mate, in nine years, I've left my number probably, you can go through the email. I think there's like thousands of uh, reviews. I probably left my number probably about oh, maybe 20, 30 times. You know, if it's, I think there's probably maybe 20, 30 bad reviews in there. And no one's ever called me, ever called me, ever. But I've schooled some people and they've taken the reviews down. With this one guy coming here, we're with sticky fingers, we're doing the sticky finger chicken wings. Yeah. And we're with the boys at the front, we're doing like a little promo and we'll get some photos and stuff. And I have my phone behind the counter. And um, I was, I came inside to check my phone. We did a post, you know, I'm down here with the boys, we're introducing sticky finger chicken wings, etc. all the family here. And um, I was checking my phone and then went back outside. And then about an hour later, this review comes up. I went to Bondi Tony's, the fries weren't that hot. And uh, I went inside and he was at the counter and he didn't even give me any attention. Blah, 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 blah. Tony's this, Tony's that. Bondi's an arrogant fuckboy. That's what he said in the review. I was like, what the fuck? Arrogant fuckboy. <laughs> so I just sat down and just, I was like, mate. Did you take a deep breath, dude, uh, I just went, mate, you're going to get something here, you know. So I wrote back to him. I'm like, mate, I wasn't even working. I was checking my phone. And if you want to have a chat to me, mate, I was right there, bro. But you had to go home and write arrogant fuckboy. So I wrote on here, this guy's an absolute twat. You know, like I was like, mate, but you are. You're being a twat, mate. You're being rude. You know, like, like, don't call me an arrogant fuckboy, you know. And then I wrote down, the next person that comes in this venue and calls me an arrogant fuckboy gets dinner for two. <laughs> <laughs> and all these people come running down, you're a fuckboy, you're a fuckboy, you're a fuckboy. <laughs> and then we posted the picture of the guy that won it and he got dinner for two. And then the guy took his review down. <laughs> oh, so I'll school people when it's out of place. Yeah. I can handle a bad review, no dramas. And I've, you read them, like if there's a bad review, I'll, I'll, I'll say, mate, I'm so sorry you have experience, et cetera, et cetera. But if someone's going to be a dick, mate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to school you. I'm going to tell you, don't be a dick. Don't be rude. This is a hard gig as it is. But, you know, just because you had cold fries, mate, just ask for new ones you fuck with. You know, like, seriously. Yeah, while you're still here. While you you're can still get, here. Yeah. Hey, can I get new fries? No worries. Or if you've got an issue, and this happens in a lot of restaurants, not just mine, you've got an issue, you'll get a better result from talking to the people there than you will by going home and doing your little 15 minutes of fucking fame. You know, like just just quit it. If anyone says, just, just talk to the owner. I guarantee you, mate, if it's a good owner, he'll offer you free shit straight away. He will be like, mate, I'm so sorry, bills on us, you know. It's just, you know, it's like when we have you know, mix-ups mix in here. You know, we have a thing. 30 minutes, it's great. After 30 minutes, talk to the customer. If they're a bit disgruntled, because it does get busy, um, give them a free drink. After 45, if there's an issue, offer them like a percentage off. And if for some reason it's an hour, because it can happen, a doctor can get lost, everything's on the house. We have a rule, a set rule, 30 minute boom, 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 you know? And sometimes those people, like I had a couple that sat over here a long, long time ago, 
And they um they had a bad they I, f- I forgot to put their order in. It was me actually, and uh, I said I'm so sorry guys I I forgot to put your order in. Everything's on the house. Drink whatever you want. Eat whatever you want. Everything's on the house. They're like no 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 it's okay. I said guys that's our rule. Everything's on the house from now. On. They left and left a twenty dollar tip. You know so when you own it and I tell all my staff if there's a fuck up go and own it. Don't make any excuses. Go you know what I fucked up. Obviously you know if the old couple don't say that but if it's a cool bunch of kids go I just fucked up your order and this is what's going to happen. I messed up. I'm going to fix it and I'm going to give you something in return for my fuck up. Nine times out of ten, they're going to go, oh, dude, no, it's fine. It's totally fine. But if you go over and say, oh, listen, you know, some guy was late today and the kitchen did this. They're going, I don't give a fuck. It's your problem, bro, you know, but own it. And the results you get are next level. And even the staff, like, they have the confidence here. If they fuck up, then they, they, they and they have to give a discount. They run the docket. Sorry, Tony, I fucked up. Own it. I'm never going to get mad at them, but if you're going to hide it, yeah, I'm going to go hell for leather. But if you're just honest about it, hey, we all fuck up, you know. But So I see dockets, oh, I've messed up, food was late, food was late, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just, no worries, but own it. And a person who comes in and has a bad experience, own it and just talk to the owner, <laughs> you know, and have a chat with him and you'll get an instant result, you know. Yeah, love it, mate. Yeah, and reviews, reviews. Oh, <laughs> I, know, I, I know. I know. Some of them are stupid. Um, I would say more people that come in here have a good experience and a bad experience and part of that, Tony, is – doing a shot with Bondi, Tony. <laughs> now, when my mum and dad first came over to, to visit me in Australia, um, obviously we, we, I, the first place I bought them was here. Yeah. And as soon as my dad sat down, you were you clocked it was me. <laughs> you clocked it was my dad and you were straight over with a bottle of Jameson's to do a shot. It's quite, uh, well, so much that I'm uh, not on anymore because I'm not that much, but when uh, a mate of mine, Monty, he's in a band called Delta Rig, we named a burger after him. He, um, he works for Jamison. And uh, he could see I was always going around and doing shots with customers. It's a, it's a great icebreaker, you know. It's just it's a connection with customers. And excuse me, I love doing shots, you know. Tequila, you know. It's like liquid cocaine, isn't it? <laughs> and um, so I go around and do shots with customers. And he's he went back and he said, "Listen, I've got his joint. This guy always does shots with his customers. You know, he has a you know like he doesn't. There's nothing silly, but you know, he'll have a celebration shot or if there's a really nice table, he'll buy him a round of shots. And um, we should get Jamison in his hand." Because they every time they do shots, everyone takes a video of it or takes a picture. So Jamison came in and they sponsored my shots. So they came in and they gave us like uh, six bottles a month, okay, and we did shots and we posted Jamison. So that went on for, I don't know, about two years. So I became addicted to Jamison. <laughs> but how cool is that? I got sponsored for my shots. So good, So man. it was pretty cool, man. It was pretty cool. And especially when Irish come in, they're like, why would you pick that? Because Irish. I'm like, nah, it's because it's my favourite whiskey. And it is. It's my favourite whiskey, you know. And it's funny because different drinks make you feel a different way. Whiskey gets me high, yeah. puts me on a buzz, you know, <laughs> something, something, you know, wine, you know, brings me down, you know, but whiskey, whew, I'm like buzzing, I'm like, Yoo! you know, so when you're walking around the venue buzzing, everyone else buzzes, you know, so. If you can yeah. do that at your place of work, man, how good? Huh? If you can do that at your Absolutely. place of work, how good? Absolutely, you know, I live on the road, so I can just walk home, you know, so I do miss that part of it, being over at Emerald, I do miss it, you know, and I will get back here, but I've got to build a team over there first, I've got to build that culture, build what we've built here, you know, and I'm blessed, like, you know, I... In the last couple, I started meditating again in the last two weeks after getting out of a, you know, a tough patch. We all go through them. I went through a really tough patch. And um, so I talked to a few people. Number one, start meditating. So I did. So I get up every morning, I meditate. And then I have just a, a little moment of just gratefulness. You know, I'm grateful I have a successful business. I'm grateful I have a beautiful son. You know, I talk out loud after the meditation. I've got a beautiful little back area, in a, you know, um, uh, um, back, um, back, um, back, um, backyard. You know, I'm grateful that, you know, I, I have three meals a day. I'm grateful that, you know, I have all my senses. I'm grateful that, you know, I, 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 you know I, I do, I've got a good crew of friends. I'm grateful that I can call anybody and ask them for help. And then I go and I'm grateful right now that I can stand up and I can walk down the beach and swim in a beautiful ocean, you know. And, that, and I do that every day now without fail, you know. And I just feel, I know, I just feel better. You know, I get all teary. <laughs> I just feel better. I just feel... <laughs> it just feels, oh, fuck, sorry. <laughs> um, just going through a bad patch. Um, it just feels better to just be, I know, present again. And it's great because the staff, the staff feed off that big time, you know, big time. So, sorry. All right, mate. <sighs> so, yeah, so it's good. It's an it's, it's amazing thing I've done to, uh, to, to come back from where I was. And, um, and now I'm just grateful that, you know, I see this venue differently now. I walk in and go, fuck, man, this is, this is a good joint. You know, this is an amazing joint. And... And I'm so blessed to have a successful business. And it's been through so many ups and downs. Like, I've almost lost this venue twice, almost, you know. And that's definitely made me stronger. and made the business stronger, you know. And I've had so many people around me support me 
when I've gone through those down times, you know. But, you know, this is a hard gig. It's not easy, you know. And people see, oh, yeah, it's always fun. But behind the scenes sometimes, it's fucking tough, mate. It's fucking tough, you know. But I've got killer staff. Like, I've got, I've got loyal staff, you know, at the moment, you know. I've got, like, these two girls that have been with me for, like, five, six years, Veronica and, and Abby, just... And I'll put Absolute through, guns. Uh, Absolute and I'll put guns, through hell sometimes, mate, yeah. you know. Like, Abby's almost walked out a few times, you know. They're the superstars um, of this place, mate. Absolutely, mate. Yeah. mate. Oh, without fail. You know, and, like, you know, Abby, Abby, you know, like, honestly, Abby's almost said, that's it, Tone. I'm out of here. I'm done with you, you know. And it's like, because, I, you know, you, you, sometimes I'll take it out on her because she's, you know, she's one of my best friends, you know. And you don't want to do that, but then that's the person to put you in place. It's like, Tone, no, you don't do that shit with me, all right? Get your shit together or I'm fucking out of here. I was like, whoa. Fuck, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay, but just I'm here for you. I'm here with you, okay? I'm not against you, you know? And she's, oh, man, she's woken me up a few times, that girl. God, balls are still that one. And Veronica as well, you know? I think because Abby was kind of the manager, I put, put more pressure on her. But now V's stepped up and she's now managing and she's killing it as well, you know? And I've got people in the kitchen like Sebastian runs a kitchen now. He's been with for ages. He runs a kitchen. So I've got a good leading team, you know, and good, and crew, good crew behind it. And this is a beautiful thing is now it... I was really worried that it would, it would drop when I wasn't here. I was really worried about it going, shit, if I'm not here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall in sales. You know? And it didn't. That's great. It wasn't an ego thing. It was just like, holy shit, this can actually survive without me. So that says a lot about the staff. It says a million more things about the staff than it does about me. And they've kept the – because, you know, the revenue hasn't dropped at all. The reviews hasn't got worse. You know, it's just been five stars. It's actually got better since I haven't been here. <laughs> fucking hell I shouldn't have said that <laughs> we miss you mate we, met, we miss you but I think just everyone's just stepped up you know everyone's had a bit more ownership and I'm not here on their tail all the time and sometimes when you give people a bit of time to breathe or a bit of space they excel they excel you know so I've learned a lot out of it too you know give people a bit of space give them a bit of, you know delegate a bit more and give them a bit uh, bit more ownership of the venue you know and it's in it and it's excelled this venue big time it's 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 on the level now, which is just just next level. Like I've never seen it this busy. Like every day, it's like, what the fuck? And mate, you've got some, you've had some really big names come through here. Like a few weeks ago, Travis Barker and Courtney Kardashian. Yeah, that, mate, that was interesting. Like he was just outside. We've got some good artwork that Cindy Sin did. He's another really good artist. And he was taking photos and he came around and stuff. And um, he was, uh, it's like, I was like, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm taking photos. I'm like, oh, fuck, Travis Barker. I said, hey, mate, how are you? I said, come inside, have a look inside. It's cool. So he comes inside, he's looking around. He's like, mate, this is fucking sick. You know, and then he said, oh, do you work in the industry? I said, oh, I used to, I used to do bands and stuff, you know. And uh, we started having a bit of chit-chat and he started asking a few questions. It was really super nice. And then I said, now, he said, oh, can we get some food? I'm like, oh, we're actually, we're actually not open. I never said they got food. Everyone thought they ate here. They didn't eat here. He said, can we get some food? And we're just, we're just opening up. I said, oh, I can't. So, so basically I uh, had some food next door at Funky Pies. And, um, and, uh, and then he went over and uh, I said, mate, well, let's, let's get a photo. That'd be great if we get a photo. He goes, yeah, fuck you. And I've, I don't like putting pictures of people who come in here on Instagram, you know? And he's like, mate, absolutely do. Let's definitely get one. He said, have you got a Polaroid? I'm like, yeah, I do. He goes, let's get a fucking Polaroid. And he goes, Corny, come here. We're going to get a photo with this dude. And she's like, yeah, cool, no worries. So she came over and he goes, where do you want us to be? And I was like, I just thought they are going to tell me to fuck off, you know? And he was like, where do you want us to be? I said, maybe in front of the logo. He goes, yeah, no worries, bro. Let's do it in front of the logo. And he goes, okay, where do you want us to be? I said, I'm just stand there and I'll take the picture. He goes, yeah, no worries. So he took a picture. He's like, is it good? Cool, okay, no worries. Good luck, mate. All the best. And I gave him two of the free little burger cards. I said, come back. He hasn't come back to eat, you know. But so, um, yeah, so it was kind of deceiving in that little note. I said, you know, everybody loves a, bit of, loves a bit of BTs. It was just, I was talking about me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everyone loves a bit of BT love. <laughs> but, um, and that went nuts. Like I, I didn't realise how much people... Follow. I, I didn't know, you know, that sounds a bit ignorant, but I just didn't know. And we had stations call up and this and that. I was like, no, nah, I'm not talking about it. I don't want to talk anything about it. It happened. That's it. The moment's over. I'm not going to talk about them or anything like that. I respect their, respect their privacy, et cetera. Although I did ask for a photo, but not with me, but just in the venue. And um, I didn't expect it to go that crazy, but it, it went viral big time and stuff, you know. And yeah, it was great. You know, put us on the map a little bit, you know, even more. So that was cool. But um yeah, it was, it, was, it was a funny one. Yeah, it was a funny one, that. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, we've had a lot of big people in here, you know? What was that guy? Who um, else? Uh, Mark, a, a, yeah, example comes in. I've seen him in a few times. Oh, he comes in all the time. Yeah. He's a good mate. Yeah, he's a legend, yeah. And uh, Michael Fazbender, that actor. So he used to, um, he was doing Aliens here in Australia. And he used to always come in here all the time by himself. And he'd just sit there and eat by himself. And just, we knew who he was and stuff. And he was really chatty with the staff. He was such a nice bloke. And then one day we were out the front and... Um, yeah, we were looking at a mate's bike and he came out and he's like, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, mate's bike goes, man, I've got one of these back in England. I've got this bike. And he was just like 
just this dude, you know? And then he said goodbye and that was it. And he came in quite a few times. And then about two months later, his minder was here and he goes, listen, I've just had a call from uh, Michael Fazmetter. Um, he wants me to send you one of his caps. I went, what the fuck? He goes, yeah, he wants one of your caps. I'm like, yeah, no worries. Okay, cool, got a cap. And then he sent him a cap wherever he was. So, but yeah, he was a legend. Yeah, yeah, Chris Hansworth would come in with his crew after he'd done Thor and stuff. But, but yeah, yeah, you get a lot of people in here. It's good, you know, but, but it's not busy because of that. And I never wanted it to be busy. And that's why I think it's the only time I've posted a photo online of anyone that's come in here, just because it, it was a real, um, uh, like really honest moment, you know, it wasn't sort of forced. But everything else, like if people are eating here having dinner, I'm not going to ask them for a photo and stuff and then put it on social media. It's just, nah, not really my gig, you know. But, yeah, I did it once. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It was Travis Barker. You know? Yeah, yeah. He's, exactly. a, he's, a, he's a legend, you know. Exactly, mate. So, At yeah. 20, we've taken up so much of your time today, <laughs> mate. Like, I want to try and round out the conversation. You've touched on it a little bit. Um, a little bit about your sort of mental health journey over the last couple of months or so. How's, yeah. your, how's your head today? Oh, it's awesome. Totally back. 100% back, mate. It's like, yeah, it's it's like completely present and just, yeah, just ready. Because, you know, me not being present, it would put a lot of pressure on my business partner big time. You know, he had to step up, you know, and I didn't realise I didn't realize how bad it got. Like, it was pretty bad, you know. And, you know, people calling me and asking me if I was okay. Um, but, you know, I just, it, you, you don't realise how much support network you have around you, you know. And not until I came out of it did I realise how many people worried about me, you know. And... It was, yeah, it was, it was amazing. You know, people were just like, you know, fuck, we were really worried. It's like, really? It's like, yeah, it was, it was pretty fucking obvious, mate. I was like, really? You know, like, you know, like Adam at the Beaver, you know, called me up. You know, he said, are you okay, mate? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, dude, you're coming here. You don't talk to anybody. You sit at the bar by yourself. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, it's pretty obvious, mate. I was like, fuck. And then I just came out of it. Just boom. I was like, what the fuck? Do you reckon it was a meditation on the gratitude? No, because I hadn't done that yet. Oh, right, I did that right, after, right. you know. I hadn't, I, there's no moment that sticks in my brain why I came out of it. I just came out of it and was just like, what the fuck have I been doing? You know, and then. What did that feel like, Tony? Like a Amazing. I think the first conversation I had was with V, who's over there. <laughs> first chat was with her and she's just like, fuck, it's good to have you back, you know. I think it was the first time I've actually spoken to someone about it. And then she was telling me about, you know, yeah, this happened and this happened and this happened. And I was like, no way, yeah, fuck Tony. Yeah. Like, and you had Shit. no recollection? I had recollection, but I, at the time I didn't know I was feeling it at all, you know. It was just it was just full on depression. Yeah, full on depression, you know. And I didn't didn't turn to drugs on, didn't turn to drink and nothing like that. I didn't turn to any substance to to numb it, you know, because I was always working at Emmore. I just felt like shit. Yeah, and I just everything was everything was an issue. Kick my toe, ah, oh, the fucking world's against me. You know, I just just played the victim, you know, victim, 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 and I was like, fucking hell, stop being a fucking victim, mate. You've got something really good around you and you can't even see it. People would be like be stoked to have a venue that's full seven days a week and you're just running around like fucking, the, you got nothing. You Once know? you're in that victim cycle, wow. you can't actually see Dude. it though, mate, hey? I've never been in it like that before. It was intense, mate. Yeah, full on, you know. I cut off from everybody, absolutely everybody, you know. Even and then my, just one day, it felt like a weight lifted. It felt this weight lifted. I, I don't know what happened. Just one day, I was just like, oh, fuck, wow. And then... I was like, okay, when do you get back on track? And I didn't even want to go to work. Everything was an issue. The staff at MO were just like saying to Steve, my business partner, what's wrong with Tony, man? Like, it's just, you know, it's, it's not really nice to be around, et cetera, et cetera, and stuff, you know? And I ended up, when I was going through, I ended up calling them all and saying, look, guys, just having a tough time, you know, please don't leave, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're like, oh, thanks for calling us and letting us know. So, look, I'm just, I'm not dealing with having two venues and the pressure of running two venues, you know? It was, it was too much. I had no spare time, you know? But, Hey, I'm out of it now and I'm fucking loving it, you know. I'm back and and we'll do a lot better because I'm back and this venue will do a lot better because I'm back and everyone around me will do a lot happier because I'm happier, you know. If I'm happy, everyone's happy. If I'm down, everyone's fucking down around me because I would bring people down when I wear my heart on my shoulder, you know. So if I'm down, people fucking feel it, you know. But I'm back, baby. Oh, that's I'm good back. to have you back, mate. <laughs> Look, final question from me, Tony. Um, you opened this place back in 2015, so coming on nine June years 17. now. June 17. What? What do you know now that you wish you knew back then in terms of running a business like this? Uh, pay my super and pay my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, those that's are the kind of lessons you uh, learn the hard way, mate. mate yeah. tell you, <laughs> I, when this opened up, was doing really well. I was just partying. I was like, oh, all this free money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, Tone, um, see what happens at the end of each month. So you have to give something to the government. I was like, no, really? I can't just spend all of it? No, mate, you can't spend all of it. You've got to give a cut to the government. 
fuck, I've, I don't have any business partners. Yeah, the government's your business partner, yeah, mate. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think uh, that's if I had it over, I'd run it. At the beginning, we'd do a lot of cash and stuff, you know, with kids and shit and travels and stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's old news now, so it doesn't matter. But it was just, yeah, it, was, it wasn't run exactly the way it should be run as a business because I, I didn't expect it to go the way it did. You know, I just, I thought I was... I was, I, was, I was grateful it was actually working and I had no real game plan like, oh, I've got a bar, let's see what happens, you know. So if I had my time back over, I would 100% run it by the books from day one, proper, pay taxes on time, pay super on time, all that sort of shit because it just catches up with you. And a lot of business owners will tell you that, you know, when you open The first thing, remember called Damien, um, Damien Down, he um, is in uh, Sneaky, Sneaky Sounds. I remember talking to him one day and when I opened up and he goes, Tony, just... Don't do the mistake we made, okay? Or not we made, you know, but it's something we need to do. Um, pay your fucking super because you don't have to pay your super. And if you don't, guess what? You know, you get this big bill at the end of the month and stuff. So I was like, yeah, whatever, I'm fine, mate. Don't worry, I'm fine. No dramas, you know. But, but yeah, the biggest thing As I someone think who works just, in the super industry, to an hour, it yeah. you to pay your, <laughs> <laughs> make sure you pay your super. Oh, mate, we're all on the books now, mate, 100%, <laughs> you know. But at the beginning, I was just, I was pretty green, you know. So I had to wake up pretty quick, but I sort of ran pretty, pretty, um, pretty sloppy business for a couple of years, you know. But. But, um, but yeah, now obviously, you know, it's all kosher. But, but, um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest thing I would have done. I would have ran it probably from start, you know, as a proper business. But I didn't know. So, you know, I was just flying by the seat of my pants. And is it difficult for you, Tony, like as a little guy compared to some of these, you know, chains like, like Grilled and, and Betty's? They, they've moved into Bondi more recently. Like, yeah, it, hasn't, it hasn't affected us. Like every time someone moves into Bondi with a burger joint, I'll go, oh, shit, here we go. But you know what? It doesn't touch us. Betty's didn't touch us. Grill didn't touch us because they're not community players. I mean, they're great products themselves. You know, they've, uh, Betty's and that, like, they're, they're amazing franchises. But th- th- what gets us through when things like that happen is the community. People don't just go to another joint. They stay with you because they trust you. You know, they're not like, oh, I'm going to go to Betty's now. You know, they come here for a reason. It's not just the food. It's the vibe. It's the staff. It's the atmosphere. It's, it's, it's location. You know, it's everything. There's, and some of the venues can't offer that, you know. So when you've got that whole package... You know, people, they're not just going to leave. You know, they're going to stay with you for sure, you know. So we've got loyalty from customers. You know, we've got people that have been coming here, you know, like, like the Rafa Burger, you know. He was, I met him a year after we opened, the guy. And now his son's, I think, like, I think his son's like 10 or 11 or something like that. And we named a burger after him, the Rafa Burger, you know, because he helped me through a tough time back then as well. Um, we have uh, the Boston Chicken Wings named after my mate Alex's kid, you know. So uh, the Boston Chicken Bites, you know. We have the... Um, the April, Abbey April Spritz. We have the Vero Valentino, you know, Veronica and stuff, you know. So we kind of include people on the, on the, on the menu, but more so, we, you know, locals on the menu as well. So, but yeah, I don't think people don't, when something you get opens, they don't just get up and leave. You know, it's like, the people around here are very loyal to us. Very, very loyal. You know, like you walk around and just, you know, I have those, you know, those little free burger cards, you know. I remember one time I was driving my car and the little park cards that say, uh, you're a bloody legend, free burger and beer. You know, and I give them out every now and then. You know, I never leave home without them, okay? I think I've got some in my wallet now. But um, I remember one time I was, out, I was out west and I was in my car and I was trying to get in. And this, no one would let me in, you know. I was in a nice car. So they're like, oh, you fucking wanker, wanker. And then this, this, uh, this tradie car came by and let me in. There was these two girls in it, okay? And then we pulled up. I was like, thank you, fuck, you know. And I had a Range Rover, right, okay? So wanky car, okay? But, and um, they let me in. So then we pull up the lights and I find the window. I said, why don't you window? And I'm like... And I gave them the two free burger cards, you know. They're like, what the fuck? They're like, oh, my God, we love your burger joint. I was like, get the fuck out of here. And I said, thanks for letting me in and not being twats. Anyway, they ended up coming in and, you know, so I'm like, hey, he got a free burger card. They came in like ages and ages later and I happened to be here at the time. But it was, um, yeah, just little things like that, you know, like little like little moments and stuff. And you get loyalty out of that, you know, you know, like all the time. But, yeah, I never leave home without those cards. You'll be sitting in the post office and somebody in front of you will be going, oh, I went to this joint the other day, Bondi Tony's, it was really cool. I'm like, hey, I'm Tony, there's a free burger, you know? Just always little little moments, taking advantage of little moments of happiness, you know? And they're like, oh, no way. And the return rate on them is insane. Every day we get the cards back, every day, you know? But, um, and they're on a really thick piece of paper. So you, they last forever. And there's no, there's no conditions, just it's a free burger anytime you come in, you know? People come in, oh, it's a Sunday public holiday, can I use it? Fuck yeah, any day, you know? So... Perfect, mate. Well, yeah. maybe we'll get the Bondi podcast burger on the menu someday, Danny. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Mate. <laughs> no, we'll leave it there for today, Tony. Awesome. Thank you so much for hosting us no worries, and man. the restaurant, no, mate. I'm glad you popped in. And yeah, just thanks Bloody for being so open and honest, uh, mate. That was good. Cheers, I mate. Enjoyed that, man. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Awesome, Cheers. Man. Cheers.